going on vinyl community welcome to another video with the record spinner in today's video i'm going to be uploading my entry to the 2020 vinyl tag uh, these videos are always fun to do because i kind of see it as a sort of first day of school getting to know you kind of thing where it's a great platform for someone to showcase uh, what their record collection is like kind of get a general idea on what is included within it um, and for people that are interested in making videos within the YouTube vinyl community I think the vinyl tag is a great place to start and you can kind of branch out from there now while it is fun doing these videos it does prove to be a bit of a challenge and I kind of set up this challenge for myself because I try to showcase different things for each question. I don't like to duplicate artists or bands. I try to, you know, be as diverse as possible. So uh, I really had to dig deep in my collection for this year's vinyl tag. But um, I think I successfully picked out different things for each um, question in this year. So enough of the chit chat. Let's jump into what this video is all about. Starting off with number one, best find of 2019. Now, 2019 brought forth a lot of great vinyl finds, um, stuff I had been itching to get for a long time, stuff that I thought I'd never see in person, uh, but the one record that stands out for this question, and I kind of got this record towards the tail end of the year, is this right here, uh, The Doors, Live at the Matrix, 1967, this came out as part of uh, Record Store Day uh, 2017. Um, I missed out on this when it first came out, and I don't know why I didn't really uh, jump to getting this when it uh, came out new, uh, but copies for a long time would go for $100 or a little bit less, just something out of my price range. And then I added it to my uh, Discogs want list, and sure enough, I got a notification that a seller uploaded this for about $40, which I think... Um, I thought that was probably going to be the best price I'd see for this release, and I was absolutely hyped to get my hands on it. It's a fantastic early live recording of The Doors. First album had just come out, so they're really at that early stage of their career, and it's just a, uh, a sensational performance, and it stands as the best find of 2019. Doors Live at the Matrix. Now on to number two, favorite album of 2019. Now, I had only picked up a couple of new albums that came out this past year, but the one that stood out the most was Dream Theater's Distance Over Time. I felt that this album was a real return to form uh, for these guys. The last album that had come out uh, from Dream Theater was 2016's The Astonishing. A great concept album, but it, I felt for myself it was a bit light in areas. Very ballad-driven, very kind of mellow, uh, yet still very progressive. But I think this album fully displays their trademark sound, which incorporates uh, elements of heavy metal and progressive rock, hence the progressive metal genre that they perfectly reside in. Uh, kind of reminded me of some of their older works, uh, such as albums like Images and Words and Awake. So I felt that this was a really nice kind of full circle kind of album where they kind of return to that classic early sound that they established in the early 90s. Uh, just an absolutely great record and my favorite album of 2019. On to number three, a novelty record. And I kind of thought about this. I don't really have too many novelty albums, but the one that I could possibly think of that stands out as a sort of novelty is the vinyl version of of Jack White's 2014 album, Lazaretto. Uh, they did all kinds of great things to the vinyl pressing for this album because um, on side A, um, the record actually plays from the inside towards the outer groove, so it kind of plays backwards. Uh, there's grooves uh, seeped into the center labels, uh, both which play at 45 and 78, and while the album does play regularly at 33, it's a record that could play all three speeds of vinyl. There's uh, dual grooves on the first song on side two, where there's like an electric intro, and then if you lift the needle, place it back in the same place it plays an acoustic intro there's locked grooves on the outer edge of side a just all kinds of bells and whistles that makes this album a sort of must have for any vinyl appreciator not just collector or music lover a vinyl appreciator all the wonderful things that are on this record and uh in a way because of its unconventional style it does stand out as a novelty record now we're on to number four Homage cover. A cover pays homage to another artist. Now, there are many instances, like for example, Abbey Road has been replicated on a couple of different albums, but the one that I thought of 
and I'm going to showcase the newer release first, is this album. This is the Ghost Live album, Ceremony and Devotion. And when I saw the cover, it kind of reminded me of Iron Maiden's Power Slave. I'm going to hold them side by side. Can you see the resemblance? So you have like Eddie in the middle and you have the two kind of figures there. And then for the Ghost album, you have Papa right in the middle and you have the two other Papas there. Kind of looks similar to each other in a way. Now we're on to question number five. And this is perhaps my favorite question in this year's vinyl tag. And that is B-side slash deep cut. And I could have picked a whole bunch of different songs for this question, but I decided to think a little bit outside the box. So the song that I chose, it is a deep cut. It appears on the B-side of this particular album, and I'm also going to be talking about the B-side of this album altogether. And I am talking about Queen 2, and the song is March of the Black Queen. That song is a precursor to what they would do in Bohemian Rhapsody. Almost has the same kind of formula in terms of the song arrangement. Uh, starts out very dramatic, has the harmonious kind of operatic kind of breakdown in the middle, and then it rocks to the very end. And it's just an outstanding track in the early Queen catalog that I think not a lot of people are aware of because when it comes to Queen, I mean, everyone knows Bohemian Rhapsody, Somebody to Love. Um, we will rock you and all that but like those early like four queen albums are just absolutely amazing and it just stands as a great accomplishment that this band had under their belt at such an early stage in their career now the b-side of queen 2 all together is like a little mini rock opera they're all different songs and they don't really relate to each other but it just all flows so brilliantly starts out with the very raucous ogre battle and then that turns into the Fairy Feller's Masterstroke, which is just completely bonkers with the instrumentation and the harmonies. And then things settle down with Freddie's piano ballad, Nevermore. Then it goes into March of the Black Queen. Then that segues into the very kind of happy, hippie going, um, funny how love is. And then it ends with Seven Seas of Rye. It's just absolutely sensational. I love this record. I love the B-side. March of the Black Queen, B-side of Queen 2. Now we're on to uh, number 6, Something Funky. And for this, I chose Deep Purple's Come Taste the Band. Now, this album kind of saw uh, Deep Purple go in a much more kind of funky direction, which drifted away from the traditional hard rock sound that they had already established with things like In Rock, Machine Head, and Burn. But it was all kind of instigated by um, the then somewhat new members, uh, David Coverdale and Glenn Hughes, who had kind of come from that sort of funky background. And they had already started to hint at that sound on the previous album, Stormbringer. Uh, and then, of course, Richie Blackmore had left the band and they brought in uh, James Gang guitarist uh, Tommy Bolin. And those three all together, along with John Lord and Ian Pace, crafted this album, which is great. But it's kind of hard to see it as a Deep Purple album if you know what you have come to expect out of Deep Purple from previous albums. It's very much in the funky direction, but it does have some great kind of funky tunes, such as Getting Tighter, which has that great bass-driven sort of middle section. Uh, you Keep On Moving, uh, Love Child is great. Um, just a great funky record altogether. Come Taste the Band by Deep Purple. Now we're on to number seven. Weird Shelf Buddies, records next to each other that make an odd pair. And I think this question is a really great one to show how diverse one's collection could be. Because sitting right next to this album, John Denver's Back Home Again with great wonderful songs such as Annie's Song, the title track, Sweet Surrender, is this album. Dio's Holy Diver with songs such as Stand Up and Shout, Rainbow in the Dark, the title track, Straight Through the Heart. Two entirely different genres of music, but when you look at my record collection and you see these two albums next to each other, you think, what an eclectic blend this guy's uh, collection is. Now on to number eight. 
I was there, a band I've seen, and I've seen a lot of bands live that I collect in my vinyl collection, but I decided to pick the one that I've seen the most times live, that being a grand total of 11 times, and that is Mr. Steve Hackett. Now, Steve uh, was the guitarist of Genesis from 1971 up until 77, and ever since he did his second Genesis Revisited album, which was around 2012-2013, uh, he has been touring regularly around the world, especially in the U.S., and um, it's always a case of any time he comes to the Northeast. My family and I always make it out to as many shows as we can. We go to all the Jersey shows as well as up in Pennsylvania, sometimes New York. Um, he has a great backing band with him. Uh, they do all the old Genesis stuff justice. Not just the standard stuff like Firth or Fifth or The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, but like deep cuts such as 11th Earl of Mar. Battle of Epping Forest, like all those great early Genesis tunes. Um, and even his recent solo stuff is quite good as well. Um, this is his uh, 2015 album, Wolf Light, which I have a lot of fond memories of, just simply listening to and seeing this tour. Um, I think I saw this tour twice. And um, an absolutely great guitarist and also a very nice guy. Um, I've met him many times at various uh, pre-show and post-show meet and greets. He signed every piece of Genesis-related vinyl and CD that I have, as well as the solo stuff. Uh, just an absolute blast seeing him live. Uh, Mr. Steve Hackett from Genesis. On to number nine, which is, wish I had an OG copy, but have a repress. I chose this album here. This is Kiss Sonic Boom. And um, if you're a KISS fan, you're aware that this album got a one-time vinyl pressing limited to 5,000 copies on various colored vinyl back in 2010. What I have is an unofficial pressing that was done quite recently. Um, it came from like the second wave of unofficial pressings that came out for this album. Um, it doesn't come with uh, the poster, the gatefold, or the inner sleeve. It just has the record itself on red vinyl and a single sleeve. And... Um, the reason why I didn't get the um, the legit vinyl copy when it came out in 2010 was just simply because I wasn't collecting or buying vinyl at that point. And I'm kind of kicking myself because the value has increased rather high. It's up to like 300 plus dollars. So in the meantime, this is kind of what I have as a placeholder in my collection. Kiss Sonic Boom. And number 10. A discography you own. You own all major releases of an artist or artist you own the most of. For this one, I picked Pink Floyd, and I almost have all major releases on vinyl. The only one that I'm missing is the Echoes Best of Pink Floyd compilation. I actually saw that at a record store once, um, and I asked about it, but apparently there was a guy coming out to the store that was going to check it out. And um, I'm kind of hoping that they reissue it at some point down the road. But in terms of vinyl, I have all the major stuff. And then aside from major releases alone on vinyl, I have a whole bunch of bootlegs. Um, basically, this entire queue that you see here is almost completely devoted to all Floyd stuff. And aside from just vinyl, I mean, I have all the box sets. I have the immersion sets. The early years, the later years, all that stuff. So Pink Floyd is definitely the artist that I own the most stuff of. On to number 11, Unique Center Label. And for this one, I chose the Black Sabbath album 13. And they did something really, really cool uh, for the Center Labels. Because if you are a collector of old school Black Sabbath vinyl, you know that um, their early stuff came on the Vertigo label. And one of the most collectible uh, label variants is the Vertigo Swirl label. And uh, what I liked that they did for, um, for the vinyl copy of 13 is that they actually replicated that Vertigo Swirl label which has a really cool look once you have it spinning on the platter on the turntable. So I thought that was really cool that they did a little nod to that like early part of their career by adding the uh, Vertigo Swirl to the uh, center label for 13. Now we're on to number 12, pre-band, album or band that featured someone who went on to be famous. For this one, I picked John Lennon's album, Imagine. And the drummer on several of the tracks on this record is Mr. Alan White, who went on to be the drummer of Yes. And he doesn't just appear on the Imagine album. He also played as part of his Plastic Ono band on the uh, live album Live Peace in Toronto. He also played on the Instant Karma single. Um, he even appears um, 
on camera when John and the Plastic Ono Band played on Top of the Pops, and then he also played on this. So this was kind of his first kind of big stab uh, before he went on to become a well-renowned drummer in Yes. <clears throat> now we're on to number 13. Musical book slash movie you'd recommend. For a book, I would choose this one here. This is called The Act You've Known for All These Years, which is a book that kind of is centered around Sgt. Pepper and how that was kind of the catalyst for the whole 60s psychedelia movement. And then it also kind of touches up on some of the rivals that were around at the same time as the Beatles, such as Pink Floyd, the Beach Boys, Bob Dylan, and the Kinks. Uh, it's a great book that kind of gives you um, a hint of what was going on at the time of 1967. And then for a movie, I picked this one. This is Iron Maiden's Flight 666. Um, if you're an Iron Maiden fan, this is a must-see. But even if you're not, it's just simply a cool film to check out. So when they did the first leg of their Somewhere Back in Time uh, world tour, they took out uh, a jumbo jet that housed both the band, crew, and all of the band's gear and stage and everything. And they went around... Let me see... I'm looking off of the back. I don't know this off the top of my head. They went around five continents, rode 50,000 miles in a matter of 40 days. And it's just an absolutely great movie to check out. And it's just crazy to think how something of that sort can be pulled off. Uh, just an absolutely fantastic film. Now we're on to my second favorite question of this vinyl tag. And that is underrated album and just like the um the b-side deep cut i could have picked a lot but for this one i picked this album not a whole lot of people talk about uh this album too much that is the man who sold the world by david bowie now this sound that he has on this record it is a complete departure from the acoustic sound that he had on Space Oddity. And it's not quite the glam sound that he would really flesh out on like Hunky Dory and Ziggy Stardust. This is a bit more of a uh, sort of hard rock, proto metal sounding kind of uh, album with things such as The Width of a Circle, uh, Black Country Rock, Savior Machine, She Shook Me Cold, which is an absolutely raunchy rock tune. And of course, uh, you get the title track, The Man Who Sold the World, which was covered by Nirvana. It's like the notable track on here. Uh, and then one of my favorites on this album is the song After All, which is like a uh, an acoustic kind of folky kind of track. Uh, this is definitely one of my favorite uh, David Bowie albums, and I think it's one that is absolutely underrated in his catalog. Now we are on to number 15, which is Batting Average, artist slash band who consistently makes good albums. Now, I feel like my answer is not going to be as interesting as some of the others that uh, people have picked um, on this particular question. It might be predictable, niche, common, but when you really think about it, you have to give it to these guys. There is no denying that this band's catalog was consistent across the board, and I honestly can't think of a, a bad album. The Beatles, hands down. And the great thing with The Beatles is that this was a band that had evolved with time. As they got older, the music got a bit more complicated. They started incorporating different influences, such as like Bob Dylan's folkier side, Indian music, psychedelia, avant-garde approaches, and you know they never really took a wrong turn. It was often embraced, and people just absolutely devoured it. And like I said, I can't think of a bad Beatles album. It's just all consistently great. Now we are on to number 16, and that is same album, different cover. Now, for this one, it is the same album. There's some slight differences on the second copy that I'll show, but it's essentially the same thing. So I chose the S album, Time in a Word. This is the common black and white lady cover, which uh, was essentially the international uh, cover for this album. And then the other copy that I have is this one here. This is a replication of what the West German pressing was like. Uh, this came out as part of uh, Record Store Day Black Friday in, I want to say, 2018. Now, what's interesting with this is that it's an entirely different cover, as you can see, but also here's a little fun fact. The, the cover that you see here was actually used for the American version of the first Yes album, but what makes it distinctively the Time in a Word cover is that it says right here time and a word in blue 
And there's also, uh, they swapped out one of the songs. Uh, there's some alternate mixes of a couple tracks. So it's slightly different, but it's it's the same thing. Yes, time and a word. Number 17. An album you bought cheap that's now worth money. Uh, for this one, I picked uh, the first album from Courtney Barnett. Uh, this is Sometimes I Sit and Think and Sometimes I Just Sit. Uh, this copy um, I bought off of eBay for $8. And this is the uh, 10 Bands One Cause uh, pressing, which comes on pink vinyl, as you see there. And the highest that I've seen this record go for on Discogs is roughly $50. So that's my uh, pick for a record that I bought cheap that's worth uh, money. And also, I think with time, this will go up because it is a colored variant and it is limited. So with time, I'm sure the value will go up. Now on to number 18, favorite drummer. There's no denying it. Neil Peart from Rush. An absolutely fantastic drummer. Emulates Keith Moon and John Bonham. Always has the right feel. And honestly, in terms of his drum fills and his playing... It's the most air drummable and just an absolutely fantastic drummer and my favorite, Neil Peart from Rush. On to number 19, Turning 20, an album turning 20 in 2020. And I'm aware of albums that have come out in 2020, but I didn't really have many, so I picked out the most obvious one. And that is ACDC's Stiff Upper Lip. This came out back in 2000, and it is indeed turning 20 this year in 2020. And now we have reached the end with number 20. A trilogy of albums, three solid albums back to back to back from the same artist slash bands should be a connecting thread. And I knew exactly what band I was going to pick for this, but I decided to pick my favorite period of this band. The band is King Crimson, and the three solid albums, back to back to back. Lark's Tongues and Aspic. Starless and Bible Black. And Red. Now, what's interesting with King Crimson is that they've never stuck with one, you know, signature sound. It's often changed to evolve with the certain lineups and periods of the band's career. And while this period still has the classic, you know, Mellotron, hard-driven sound that was established on things like In the Core and Poseidon and whatnot, um, it incorporates more, you know, Eastern European classical influences as well as European jazz influences. And I think this album, Lark's Tongues, perfectly sums up, you know, that kind of period of King Crimson in terms of the playing. Um, you had Jamie Muir doing all kinds of crazy percussion stuff. And then the rhythm section alone of John Witten and Bill Bruford is like how Robert Fripp has said before, a flying brick wall. It's an absolute powerhouse rhythm section. And this album is the perfect culmination of all of each uh, individual member's talents. And then with Starless and Bible Black, I feel that this album represents what this band did extremely well and that was improvisations and that's exactly what fueled this kind of period so what they did with starless and bible black was that they recorded shows live eliminated the audience and just used that uh parts of the shows and the improv bits to make this album now granted some of it was also recorded in the studio but capturing it in that live atmosphere uh was much better due to how this band worked and um, things like Fracture and uh, We'll Let You Know and Trio are just perfect examples of how great this band was live. And then it all wraps up with Red, which I feel is the most polished uh, this particular era of King Crimson has sounded. Now, I also should have mentioned that the lineup started to diminish um, after each album. So after Lark's Tongues and Aspect, Jamie Muir had left. And then after Starless of Bible Black, David Cross left. So it's just left with John Wett and Bill Bruford and Robert Fripp. And like I said, it's the most polished sounding, uh, the most um, well-produced, I would say, King Crimson album in terms of the layers of guitars on tracks such as Red, um, all kinds of great instrumentation going on in the last track, Starless, uh, One More Red Nightmare with like the hand claps going on in the verses. Um, it's just a brilliantly crafted studio album, and um, it's just an absolutely great album to kind of end a classic King Crimson period on. 
And there you guys go. That is my entry for the 2020 vinyl tag. If you're watching this video and you have not done a vinyl tag for this year, tag, you're it. If you enjoyed this video, please go ahead, give it a like, and subscribe to the channel. See you guys in the next video, and most importantly, keep the record spinning.